Hi everybody, we're going to be talking to Wendy Miriyama today. Um, this is going to be a little bit different of an interview. Wendy is hearing impaired, so we're, we have a list of scripted questions and you can also feel free to use the question mark icon down at the bottom to ask your own questions. Um, Wendy's a real pro. She, you know, she's very able to talk about her work and she's done this kind of thing before. Um, there's also a great um, Craft in America episode with Wendy that's on YouTube that PBS did. So I suggest everybody uh, watches that and I'll share a link to it. So we're gonna connect with Wendy. Let's just take a second. I'm also, hi. Hi Tom, how are you? So I'm, I'm gonna read the introduction. What'd you say? Um, sorry. So, oh, okay. So I'm gonna read the introduction of Wendy. Um, Wendy Murayama, furniture maker, artist, and educator, uh, has been working in wood and uh, education for over 40 years. Wendy Murayama is a professor of woodworking and furniture design for over 30 years. She's one of the first two women to graduate with a master's in furniture making from Rochester Institute of Technology. Murayama has exhibited, exhibited her work nationally for over four decades with solo shows all over the country and internationally, Tokyo, Seoul, and London. Murayama's work can also be found in both national and international permanent museum collections. So she's, she's a real pro. But I just want Wendy to uh, begin by telling us about her background. Where, where did uh, you okay. From? Well, I, I grew up in Chula Vista, believe it or not. I went to high school. And well, I went to grade school, junior high, and high school in Chula Vista and graduated from Castle Park High. And um, of course, there were no significant art programs in the schools where I've been, but I always knew that I like to make stuff with my hand. Yeah. Uh, probably to compensate for my hearing loss and my disabilities. And I felt like my art making skills was a form of communication in right. my life. So, then I, I ended up going to Southwestern College. Cool. And yeah, yeah. it was good to start. Yes. And um, it was there that I started making craft objects. Um, I've always been interested in craft, but in a very um, contemporary way, not traditional, useful thing, but um, I like to challenge that craft can be expressive and have a message in them somehow. And somehow I always kind of uh, look for that aspect with craft. And mm -hmm. so I've experimented with textiles and ceramics and metal working mm -hmm. and um, ultimately woodworking. Uh, my first woodworking class was at Southwestern and I had a female teacher, which was really, that, that I think subconsciously was very important because you always uh, saw all these guys in the woodshop right. and you know, they, they, they were often pretty patronizing. And so I feel fortunate that I had one craft teacher who had one woodworking assignment. And it seemed like, what's the big deal about woodworking being a man's job? I mean, all you gotta do is push the button and then right. the star comes on, right? So that, that's when it solidified my interest in woodworking, and I went to San Diego State. Mm -hmm. uh, San Diego State had probably 
There were probably only three woodworking schools at the college level in California. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, by the way, my parents, uh, you asked about my parents. Yeah. My, you know, there's no artist in my family. My dad worked on a farm in Hammett first when we were babies. And then he transitioned to having his own store on Sweetwater Road. And my mother was the secretary. And at one point, they both worked on the farm, you know, they wow. picked tomatoes and cucumbers. And I used to go out there with my mom and work with the, you well, know, all the laborers on the farm. I and really... I think my father spoke Spanish because all the people that he worked with were Spanish too, Spanish speaking. Wow. So we really learned to love tortillas and beans. Mm -hmm. Really loves that kind of food. But anyway, so where was that? San Diego State. And um, it was just, I really, you know, I hated high school. I hated, I hated high school. But uh, I felt like college was where I felt kind of like I belonged in a group despite mm -hmm. my disabilities and whatnot. So, uh, I sort of gained a lot of confidence in myself and yeah. felt kind of self-confident and, you know. So anyway, um, that's how I grew up from being a kid to going to college. Um, yeah, but uh, can you tell us about your college experience? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I was a professional student for 10 years. I went to school for 10 years. So I went to Southwestern and then San Diego State and got my undergraduate degree from San Diego State. And uh, I decided that I wanted to stay in school because um, by the time I really got immersed in woodworking, I felt like I was just starting to understand the media enough to, but I didn't have the self-confidence just yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the best things that I've done, and I'd recommend it to people who live in San Diego, the best thing I could have done was gotten the hell out of California <laughs> and experimented the East Coast. Uh, there's more than I in California, you know. I have a lot of former students who have never left San Diego because they want to surf and they want to, you know, the beach and, you know. But there's more to um, the art world than just being in San Diego. I mean, I applaud people who have really established themselves in San Diego. But for myself, I, there wasn't the market that I could expect to have in mm -hmm. San Diego compared to the East Coast. Um, of course, I found this out later after I went to college back east, but I ended up going to Boston University for two years to study more woodworking because um, at that point in 1970-74, Woodworking was a pretty regional profession. The woodworking on the West Coast was very, very different from what you saw on the East Coast. Um, East Coast woodworking was very Eurocentric. It comes from England, uh, you know, Scotland, and the really strong. Well, it comes with the colonies, you know, the 13 colonies established on the East Coast. And so all the woodworking, all the woodworking um, vernacular came from England, which was really traditional, a lot of hand-cut joinery, hand planes, most mm -hmm. intended. Whereas on the West Coast, it was kind of the wild, wild west. 
bir silah kıvırtıklardı ve kalktı meydanın tabiçleri bir tane hepi şef sen ama ne olur part of that whole scene back in the 70s you know I even admit that I, I wore flowers in my hair it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> but um It was very different, and that's why I wanted to go to the East Coast, because I wanted to find out how the stuff was made. Mm-hmm. And I certainly did find out, but I also realized by the time I went to graduate school that um, we're working with pretty boring in You are your only color choices were light brown, medium brown, dark brown. Right. And all of my friends in graduate school were painters, printmakers, sculptors. And I really got kind of envious of these people using paint. So I started um, painting my furniture. And it sounds like it's nothing now, but back in those days, You were considered to be blasphemous for painting your furniture, yeah, like things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, so then at one time I just had to kind of become rebellious for a while. Um, I guess uh, I just kept doing it. I didn't give a shit about what other people were thinking, you know. Yeah. Um, I had to learn to ignore a misogynist man who would say the most patronizing things like, how does a little girl like you make such big furniture? Right. And I think it's very ironic that furniture is such a domestic object. Uh, right. It's something that women usually determine Would put them right in the home, mm-hmm. but it's all these guys that are making those kind of decisions right. about how vanities are used or what vanities are for. Um, and so I feel like there should be more women in that position of uh, designing furniture for the home. You know, mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that, you know. Right. So uh, they, uh, and then, so that was my final year at graduate school was at RIT. Mm-hmm. And um, that was a difficult period for me because the, the, one of the guys that talked to was kind of sexist. And um, he used to maintain sort of a locker room mentality. Yeah. There were only a few women in in the woodworking class then, and so it was a little upsetting to, to have to deal with that behavior. Uh, you know, playboy pinups in the tour chest and Makita, you remember those Makita posters with yeah, yeah, women? Yeah, and calendars. The world power too. Yeah. I mean, that kind of stuff. So, um, of course, I did my share of pinning up Playgore pictures, <laughs> <laughs> which really was not interesting to me. I mean, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I did it just to be badass, I guess. Yeah. Um, early, early accomplishments. Uh, are these your questions here? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, right out of grad school, I got a job teaching in Tennessee of all places in the, at the Appalachian Center for Craft, which was about an hour east of Nashville, Tennessee. And that's kind of the first, oh look, Stan Smith is here, that's right, Stan is there. Anyway, um, I oh, so I never thought that I'd be living in the South, of course, but you know, there was a job 
and one of my colleagues from undergrad school had gotten hired there. And that kind of reminds me of one thing. Mm -hmm. A piece of good advice that I, that I got from one from friend who yeah. uh, his name is Bob Evendorf. He said, please generate the best friendship that you can while you're in college because they are ultimately going to be your best connection within the art world. Right. And that was totally true because um, all the friendship that I've made in college, I'm still very good friends with everybody. They were the ones that would talk, tell me about the galleries that were yeah. hot and introduced me to people who wanted to buy my work. Uh -huh. and, and then I also got all of my jobs through people that I knew from from the field. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really, and this is something I talk to my students about, it's really important to maintain those kinds of relationship and you don't really get anywhere by being a total asshole. Right. You know? I mean you and then, and then um, you get what you give. Right. If you give people advice or whatever, you're gonna get that in return. And so I'm a real um, I believe in that. I think yeah. that has really meant a lot to me to to retain those kinds of relationships. Um, but uh, technically it was interesting because I wasn't getting paid very much, but I had a, a studio to myself. Mm -hmm. I got to do anything I wanted. My teaching responsibilities were very minimal. Mm -hmm. um, I was only getting $4,000 a year, but they also paid for my room and board, and I was able to work in the shop. And so that was really, to me at that time, very valuable. And eventually, I moved on to take on the position there for a time. Mm -hmm. And um, the South is interesting, you know, when you're not in the South, you get all these preconceived notions about the South and right. Southerners. And um, I mean, I admit that the first week I was at grocery shopping, one of the local women there came up to me and said, oh, you look really new here. Did you marry one of our boys? <laughs> you know? Meaning that she thought maybe I was like a war bride yeah. from Vietnam or something. But that was kind of interesting. But I've also learned to let that stuff roll off my back. Mm -hmm. uh, this applies to racial things, uh, um, disability issues. If people say, oh, you, you, kind of, you talk kind of funny. Or, um, that just things like, can you really show up in that sugar? Right. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I've learned to kind of build up a little bit of a defense mechanism. I'm happy that women nowadays are more willing to call that out. I was maybe less likely to do that because I felt like, um, focus more on what could be perceived as weaknesses mm -hmm. rather than, and then distract people from what I can really do, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that experience in Tennessee was really good, you know, it built some, you know, I guess I got some hair in my chest, if you can imagine. And then after that, I started teaching at California College of Art in, in the Bay Area. And I taught there for about four years. And California. Like in San Diego State. DCAC, that's cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Do you have any questions? 
Yeah. <laughs> I know you had a ton of questions. I have a ton, but it's difficult. Oh, okay. Could I talk about the furniture first? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, in the 90s, furniture became so hot. I mean, there were galleries everywhere for showing furniture, especially on the East Coast. And so I felt very fortunate to have lived through that period and have been able to take advantage of that. Um, I would say between 1982 to about 1996, mm -hmm. the furniture field was really taken off and people were more interested in art furniture well, we call it studio furniture. Right. And um, unfortunately, with the recession and uh, just in recent years, the galleries have been almost non existent. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it got to be very difficult to be shipping furniture from the East Coast from the West Coast to the East Coast and vice versa. I started working on smaller objects towards the end, like this elliptic vanity that you have shown mm -hmm. up there. Um, but eventually the, the, the bottom just fell out and I felt like, okay, what am I gonna do next? I wanna keep making work. I uh, clearly am not going to be able to, I do, did not want to end up with a house full of furniture that I could right. sell. I do not like doing commissions. I, I just can't stand doing commissions. Uh, I know a lot of my friends make a pretty good living from commissions, but I just mm -hmm. can't, I can't deal with that. So... The only way that I would do a commission is if I've made something already and they want to make it, they want an exact duplicate of it. Right. right. Then I would do that with some modifications. Maybe. I think a lot of artists feel the same way. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't see your face, but you say? It's, it's okay. <laughs> okay. But right, so anyway, so I started, well, right, and then of course, everybody thinks about the things that are going on in the world. And so I felt like um, one of the things I thought about was Executive Order 906, which is the order that Franklin Roosevelt uh, initiated to move uh, Japanese Americans out of the West Coast for after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And of course, I saw a lot of parallels between 9-11 and, you know, and what was going on in Arizona with Jan Brewer trying to check anybody who looked like they might be immigrants. Right checking their ideas and so it seemed like we hadn't evolved much since 1942. Right. But also uh, my parents never talked about it, you know. And my grandparents never talked about it. I mean, my mother would talk about it because I came home from taking a history class and we were studying um, World War II. And she asked if the teacher ever mentioned the incarceration camps. And I said, what incarceration camps? And so she told me the story, and I was like really shocked. And to this day, I'm shocked that so many people don't know about this. Right. Especially, especially in the Midwest and the South and even on the East Coast. So I felt compelled to work on what's called the TAG Project, which was inspired by a photograph of uh, Dorothea Lang, who 
who was hired by the, the law relocation agency to document the executive order 9066 and she showed photographs of families wearing the paper tags that were like ID cards that had the family number, you know, named and the name of the camp where they were supposed to go. And when I found out that 120,000 Japanese Americans were removed from the West Coast, that's a lot of fucking people. So yeah. I decided that, you know, if I could recreate the tags of every person who was removed, I wanted to be able to show that, I mean, there are these people that were affected, that lost their homes and their jobs. And I also wanted to, to remind people that this could easily happen again. Right. I hate it, but, I, you know, I can sort of see it happening again. It almost happened with 9-11. Mm -hmm. But uh, believe it or not, Bush did not want that to happen because one of his, um, I think it was Norman Mineta, who was his um, director of transportation or something, he was Japanese American and was sent to camp, and Bush knew about that. Mm. And so he overrode the military uh, recommendation to round up our. Muslim Americans after 9 11. So uh, I, that was kind of a depressing body of work to do because, you know, my family was affected by it. So when I finished that project, um, I've, I've always loved animals and I kept reading about the elephants that were being poached in Africa for the ivory. And uh, again, another depressing topic, but because <laughs> I love animals so much, you know. Me too. <laughs> yeah, so I, did, I just decided to do a body of work that kind of depicts the hopefully raises awareness that people need to know that you know, we're killing the animals for, for no real reason. I mean, humans are just the worst species, in, you know, on the earth, I think. But, so um, this piece that you have up now is called the Bell Shrine, and it's based on a Japanese Buddhist um, Buddhist, which is a shrine for the dead. And there's a one bell that hangs just above it. And it rings every 15 minutes, which is when an elephant is killed for the ivory. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of elephants, if you think about it, you know. And of course, there's the pangolins and the, the rhinos. And, right. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So that was the last significant body of work that I made. So I'm on to something new now. Uh, I decided to spend a little bit of time making something really pretty and <laughs> pretty and uh, you know, simple and um, with, with no emotional baggage attached to it. But it was also part of the invitation to be at a show that honored Bauhaus. Bauhaus. Was, uh, you know, I'm trying to, in Europe, a movement of artists that eventually moved to, I think, Black Mountain and maybe Chicago, but most of the furniture people were men, of course. And I really loved uh, Annie Elbert's work, especially because I love color so much. 
And so it just made sense for me to kind of use her work as a springboard and uh, to try to be inspired by what she did and yeah. still using the medium of words. So that's how that came about. So that, you know, that was for this past year. And then this year, it's interesting because when you get invited to do certain shows, they kind of become like assignments in a way. Yes. And having been a student for 10 years, I'm so used to giving, you know, getting assignments. And of course, giving assignments for 40 years. Um, the next project is to work with, uh, I'm working with Kai Essary on the Trifecta show, which oh. I'm sure you know about. And she has paired me with a soft institute um, brain researcher. Great. It's the hopes of um, finding out how to cure uh, Alzheimer's. Wow. And at the same time, for the last six months, I've been helping my family take care of my aunt, who I was really close to, oh. that has dementia. And we finally had to put her in a memory care center in January. So the timing was kind of, um, it was really interesting how the two things came together. And so now John, John Reynolds, the uh, doctor that I'm working with from SARC, and we've been talking about perceptions and I've been thinking about the changes. I haven't seen my aunt slowly de decline. And also thinking about mirrors and how we perceive each other in a mirror. And um, so I'm making this really long mirror that's probably about five feet long. And the mirror is black lacquer. And uh, the word under the lacquer starts to underlate. So as you move from left to right, uh, the image becomes more and more distorted. Right. And so this will go in a frame. And there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be really off about this. So it's not going to be a normal frame. And, and the mirror sticks out of the frame like this instead of being contained. Mm. So there's going to be a lot of things that don't make sense. And I think it just references um, the, the what people go through when they start to lose the mental faculty. Right. Mm. So that show opened in September, I think. So hopefully the pandemic will be over yeah. by then. But uh, we'll see. I see that somebody's asked about how the pandemic has changed the way I work. Well, it's been uh, difficult. Not so much because I can't work, because I can it's just really hard to focus on, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very distracting. Yeah. It's real, um, kind of discombobulating, and um, you worry about people that you know that are really struggling. Right. Because they have jobs, and so th those kind of things are very upsetting. I feel we are bad for my colleague, Adam, who has to teach online. Right. And, uh, you know, how do you teach woodworking online? You know, uh, I don't know how people do it. But anyway, I, can't, I retired just in time, I guess. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, but, you know, I've been able to work four days a week. You know, I, I just go in there whenever I feel like it. And, uh, it's not been a problem for me anyway. 
What about for you? Are you putting salt? You are. Um, we're doing we're doing this and putting all of our content online. Yeah. Are you doing them on there? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. closing closing thoughts just to finish. <laughs> Can I show off my shit that's in the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of things that I own, but I have a lot of pieces that I've kind of picked up here and there. Cool. I also have a lot of things that people have given to me over the years. Right. I also have a lot of things that I've bought from students and other friends. So it would just be a quick walk. Well, well, we we definitely want to encourage okay. people showing and buying work. Okay. Why don't I do that then? Yeah. Okay. Let me take this thing and uh, let's see how do I turn this around so that I can't... Okay, there you go. So there's my Godzilla. Wow. Uh, and then, you know, I just redid the kitchen. So we yeah, have yeah. this new bank and new red tiles. And, and if you remember, I love animals. Okay, so I have all these little animal things all over the house. And, and let's see, cutting board by my friend Jen, Jenna, and my dog. My house is a mess because of uh, the kitchen thing. So let's go here real quick. Um, so this is the living room. This mirror is a collaborator. Well, no, it's not a collaboration. It's a metal worker that uh, works in very thin metal. Wow. And she uses uh, Prismacolor and nails uh, that was made by a friend from the East Coast. This is my animal stuff. Wow, we love seeing art in homes. That's what we want to encourage and know that's out there. What did you say? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> okay. And then, see, Bob Brady is one of my favorite sculptors from the Bay Area. He does uh, figurative work out of wood. He also made this little bird. And this is one of my grad, former grad students. It's a dovetail box with a dead bird. Oh. Yeah, I started working. Friend of mine who's a glass artist, Hank Adams. Uh, I made that table. I don't have wow. It. Yeah. And then let's see, let's go over here for a second. Oh, more animals. Hello, this uh, Maniki Naka has brought me a lot of good luck this year. <laughs> so I really believe in those things. Uh, let's see, this is my favorite room. This is the bathroom, <laughs> and uh, these are from the temples in Japan. Wow, my animals. This is uh, one of my former student sculptures made out of wood and metal. Uh, this is another anime thing from Korea. This is a print that's been printed with glass, a glass plate print. Wow. By, by Anne Walsh, she's from Sweden. Uh, and then by the bathtub, I have these little things that are Things from Japan, Mexico, more student work. I love to support student work, and I feel like 
It makes people feel so good when somebody buys the the yeah. work. And, Absolutely. And uh, let's see. And then this is the. Uh, an early piece that I made, it's a collaboration with the same metal artist that you saw earlier. Sorry, the dog is in the way. This is a blanket shot. And this is also a former student work, Rick Wrigley. Wow. With a trusted role. He had just found out that uh, he had AIDS. And so he did this piece card. An apple a day does not keep the doctor away mm. using viral pattern. So, and then this is another <laughs> thing. And this is my shrine for the dead. This is, uh, as you can see, all the ashes of my animals. Oh. <laughs> uh, my grandparents, dogs that are gone. And, of course, the dog that is here. Harry. And then, <laughs> and then this is another piece by a former student. Uh, wow. Made out of cast brown. He was just cast. And it's open to reveal this root like system. Very cool. Uh, I think the sun showed without showing all the dirt. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the kitchen now. Against my animals, with my mess. This is a white the first, but I don't know if you know white the first. No. Uh, let's see. This is time up on. Uh, Judy McKee, Bab Trap, and my animals. And then this present by Todd McKee from Boston. Hmm. So, I said, oh, one more thing. Another mask by Robert Brady. There. Beautiful. And my friend Esther Shimazu, who does these beautiful little ceramic sculptures. Wow. And of course, she has a dog. And I love the teeth on this thing. Yeah. She's really amazing. And of course, the woman is pudgy and Asian, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the only other thing I have to say about the pen, oh, here's another one. This is a stroller from... Australia, she takes household objects like this and then she cuts them out like this. And then she takes all the pieces and makes them into things like this. Wow. Which is another necklace. So you could see the... the Kind of that, and then the other thing that she made with the other parts, with another necklace. So you could see the dust thing came out of here. So I kind of like the way she transitioned the part from this piece into these two. Right. So you can also start to see the Australian uh, with Aborigine influence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 
There's so much artwork in your home. That's it. Uh, uh, I hope you can answer this last question. Anything but, oh, um, well, the Japanese crafted phenomenon in terms of the execution, and there's such, such a long history of craft in Japan, and it's just you're just humbled when you go there to see the temples and the gardens and, you know, K.O.I., of course, you know, but it's like, it's just mind-blowing. It's a little, I mean, you can't help but be inspired by what you see in Japan and the way they use different materials. Um, for some of the temples, they clad the outside of the wood beams with mm -hmm. thin sheets of copper with nails on them, and that kind of thing is really amazing to see. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about residency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, one of the best things that I've done for me is to apply for residencies to work in other countries. Um, it's nice to work in other cities within the U.S., but I think it's also much more... Uh, well, it just opens your mind so much when you go to work in France or Japan or even the U.K. Uh, I have applied, I have worked in France for six months. And of course, they've got a very strong history of furniture. So I was really like enjoying visiting all the chateaus mm -hmm. and seeing all the candelabra and vanities and um, Louis the Fourteenth furniture. And then when I was in England, I really felt like I had been there before in a past wow. life. Wow. And I think it was because of the kind of furniture that I was studying, I really saw the connection between what was being made there in connection with what we were trying to learn mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, especially the earth and craft movement. Right. And um, oh, who's that guy? Who's that philosopher? That, not William Morris, but Ruskin, I, I, John Ruskin. Okay, I was going to say William Morris. The philosophy on craft was really uh, kind of amazing to come across. Hmm. And then, um, let's see, uh, Anyway, I, I, I really encourage my fellow artists to try to apply for residencies, even yeah. in the United States. Uh, I spent some time in Vermont, and, you know, right in the middle of snow season. And I think that has a real profound effect on how you see color. If you're in a place that's really snowy and gray and white, all of a sudden, you become aware of a different color palette mm -hmm. that you probably wouldn't notice before. I'm sure. But uh, anyway, even if it's for a week, you know, if you go to Arizona for a week, uh, you know. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was the last thing I wanted to mention, you know, the importance of getting out of your comfort zone. Right. How's Harry? How's Harry? Harry's great. Harry's you know, your dog. I love Harry. If he could only help me stay in my wood, he would be perfect. Yeah. So, uh, I miss seeing everybody. I miss Kathleen. I miss Ty. I miss all the people. I miss you. I miss... Right. We're going we're gonna to be doing an interview with you also next week. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think we're done. I think okay. we're ending.
but no problem. Uh, it's kind of fun. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you later. We are gonna be putting this on YouTube. Bye. Okay, great. Bye. Bye. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So we are adding Wendy's interview to YouTube and thank you everybody for hanging in there. I've never um, interviewed anybody with a hearing impairment. So thank you for hanging in there and it was really fun. And I think Wendy did a great job. If anybody has a moment, which I know everybody does right now, there is a great video of Wendy Mariyama uh, produced by PBS and it's called Craft in America. If you just YouTube Wendy Miriyama on, or if you search Wendy Miriyama on YouTube, that Craft in America episode will come up. It lays it all out there and it explains so much about her. It shows more of her furniture and uh, conversations with her. Um, really fantastic interview with her. And she also just received a grant from um, uh, an organization called um, USA artists and it's a pretty large grant. So she's, you know, she's the real deal and it's so great to have her as a tenant at Bread and Salt. She shares a studio with Adam Manley. We're gonna be doing an interview with Adam uh, in about a week. So coming up tomorrow is Jason Sherry, then Belize Iriste, Tom Driscoll. We're adding more people all the time. Thank you everybody for watching. You know, it's hard to kind of ask spontaneous questions yeah, so some people obviously have seen this Craft in America episode. It's fantastic. You have to watch it. Um, so Wendy's a uh, San Diegan. She is a tenant in the building. You know, when things get back to normal, you know, hopefully you can see some of her work. The Minge has her in the collection, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So many places across the country and the world have Wendy in their collection, and she's a treasure to have here in San Diego and also in the building. So just to kind of finish up, uh, keep checking on YouTube and um, yeah, thank you for watching. See ya.